Hello everyone and welcome to St Paul's Online. My name's James and I'm one of the ministers here at St Paul's. And I'm Viv. I'm a ministry apprentice on staff with the Evangelical Christian Union at Sydney University Cumberland. So whether you're meeting with us online via Zoom or gathering in person in a watch party, it is such a joy to have you with us today. A special welcome to you if you're new or visiting. You know, about 3,000 years ago, King David in Psalm 29 exclaimed, Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Let's pray that God would bless our time together today and that we would ascribe to God the honor due his name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the ways in which we can continue to gather in this time. Orient our hearts and our minds towards you. Help us to honor you with our thoughts, words and deeds and equip us to serve you with all of our lives, not just now, but every day of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing now as we give thanks to God and teach and admonish one another. So please join us as we sing. Hi, St. Paul's. We're the band from North Rocks. My name is Craig. We have Denise. Over here we have Tim, Ian, Felicity, Matt and Paul. Please join with us as we sing together. We 
So Viv, what's university ministry look like in this time? Yeah, so it's been online for a number of months now, which of course has its challenges, uh, but it has been so encouraging to see relationships continue as we encourage one another uh, to grow in God's word, as we've persisted in meeting together in small groups uh, to, for Bible study and one-to-ones and in training. And a particular highlight has been actually that evangelism, although it's looked different online, it's been so wonderful to see students persist in being passionate about sharing Jesus with our campus. Um, And a number of people are actually exploring um, Mark's gospel with us at the moment. So that's been really great. Well, while university ministry may look different, God's word remains the same eternal, steadfast and life-giving gift, a lamp to our feet. We're about to read the Bible. So would you join with me in praying before we hear God speak from his word? Thank you, Father, for making yourself known to us and showing us the way of salvation through faith in your Son. Father, would you teach us through your word and equip us for every good work for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So we're going to read God's word now from Romans chapter 6, verses 15 to 23. You'll find a link to that passage in the description of this video if you don't have a Bible with you. From verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness, But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you've come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You've been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, So now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things that you were now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, friends, let's pray as we come to God's word today. Father, we ask for your help. Give us your Holy Spirit that we might hear your voice and respond in repentance, faith and obedience. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today in uh, Romans chapter 6, we are talking change. And we picked up this topic with Dave last week. And it's a really important topic because almost everyone that you meet has something about themselves that they would love to change. It's why each year at the start of the year, we make New Year's resolutions uh, because we all have things that we want to change, things about ourselves that we wish were different. Uh, Whether it's a physical thing, we we look at our appearance in the mirror and we think, I want to change that. Uh, That was my experience when when I turned 30. I looked in the mirror after a shower one day and I realized that my teenage metabolism had gone on strike and it was at that point I joined the gym, I made a change. But it can also be more substantial things that we want to change about ourselves, isn't it? Whether it's that we wish we weren't so shy or we wish that we didn't lose our temper so much or we wish that we were just more patient with our children or our family We wish we were more disciplined with our time. There are so many things that we wish that we could change. And Christianity is a message that has change at its heart. And Romans chapter 6 is one of the key passages to get right when it comes to thinking about the process of change in the Christian life. Now, Paul is going to help us to think through the, the process of change in light of the fact that Christianity is totally different to the other religions of the world. You see, in religion, 
why is it that people try to change? It is central to the religions of the world is the idea that if you can just get yourself together enough, you kind of improve your spiritual standards, then God will reward you. That's the script of religion. And yet what we've seen in Romans so far is that this description of religion, this idea of doing good works in order to earn God's favour, that couldn't be further from the gospel message that Paul has been teaching in Romans. In fact, in Romans so far, Paul has spent five chapters showing us that that none of us are good and that whatever rules there are, we've all broken them and none of us can meet God's standard. And in the place of religion, Paul has been laying out the message of the gospel, that we can be declared not guilty, even though we're wicked because God shows grace. Uh, Paul had this idea back in Romans chapter 4, verse 5, where he speaks of the God who justifies the ungodly, a a work that God does by grace. Uh, And and with the cross of Christ, God has has done a swap, a a glorious exchange where where our sin is taken away and atoned for by the death of Jesus. And Christ's righteousness is given as a gift to those who have faith in Jesus. And when that happens, says the book of Romans, we are declared righteous and welcomed by grace, not by works, into God's kingdom. Now, why are we talking about all this? Well, as we come to talk about change in Romans chapter 6, for the religious person, this presents something of a problem uh, when it comes to motivation. You you see, if it is the case that your place in heaven is is already decided by grace, then what's the point of trying to change? That is, if grace has the final word and your spiritual scorecard is not marked according to your ability to obey God's rules, God's law, but according to God's grace and forgiveness— then doesn't that take away all motivation for change? And this is the issue that Paul kicks off today's passage with. Great to have your Bible there. Romans chapter 6, verse 15, Paul asks the question, What then shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Now, as usual, Paul is kind of a step ahead of his readers, us, uh, and he's anticipating the questions that we might have. And he's got an answer for us. And his answer is, end of verse 15, he says, by no means, absolutely not. And if you're with us last week, all of this should be sounding kind of familiar because last week, as as we opened up the beginning of Romans chapter 6, Paul was tackling a a similar objection. Have a look, Romans chapter 6, verse 1, Paul wrote, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? And and Paul's answer last week to the question of change was all about being united to Christ. That just as Christ died, our old life died with him. And just as Christ has been made alive, now we who are alive in Christ should live a a new life to God's glory. That was the reason for change from, from last week's passage. This week, however, Paul has a slightly different angle, a similar question. Shall we sin because we're no longer under law, but under grace? Uh, Same strong negative response, by no means, but a new reason. And Paul introduces his reasoning in, in verse 16. Have a look at it with me. He says, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, You are slaves of the one you obey. Uh, Paul's reason for change this week revolves all around the whole idea of slavery. We seek change because we're no longer slaves to sin, but we're now slaves to God. That's where we're going today. In fact, just skip ahead with me. See Paul's kind of summing of it all up down in verse 22. Uh, Verse 22, he says, But now that you've been set free from sin, that's what's happened, and... You've become slaves of God. And Paul's argument through this chapter is that when you become a Christian, you get set free from sin and you become a slave to God. Paul is saying that if you're a Christian, you're a slave. And I wonder how how you feel about that. Is that how you think about yourself as a Christian, as as a slave, as God's slave. Uh, I wonder how you'd feel if we kind of decided to run a, a paid marketing campaign on Facebook to reach outsiders with the news of Jesus. And we say, G'day everyone, I'm Sam. I want to invite you to come and explore Christian things with us. I'm a slave and we're inviting you to come and be a slave too. Join us this Sunday. Now, at first glance, that, that just doesn't sound all that appealing. It kind of sounds weird to our modern ears and confronting even. 
And yet Paul, in today's chapter, he seems to rejoice in this. In fact, he's going to speak of the benefit of slavery. And so our aim today is to dig into this idea of being slaves to God, to see how good it is, and to see if we can make sense of the fact that Paul lays it before us as a reason to live changed lives. So let's dive in. Paul begins laying out his premise. Verse 16, he says to us, Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey. And that's a simple enough uh, premise, isn't it? If you offer yourself to someone to, to obey them, well, then you've become their slave. So what do you obey? Because working out what you obey will help you to see what you're a slave to. That's straightforward enough, isn't it? Think about it. If you offer obedience to, to your cravings to eat junk food all the time, then you're a slave to junk food. If, if you offer your obedience to your desire to do nothing and relax all the time, well, then you're a slave to laziness. Paul says you're a slave of whatever it is that you offer yourself up to. Now, the Roman world was, was full of, of slavery. Um, but, but as we get into this, it, it's good for us to note that, that Roman slavery in the first century was a little different to what we might imagine today. Because when we talk slavery, we think of the, the things like the, the forced enslavement of, of African people being, being taken against their will to the United States in the, the 16th and 17th centuries, kind of with devastating personal and, and cultural impact. Or, or maybe we think of the, the sort of forced trafficking of, of women, vulnerable women, into a life of sexual slavery and prostitution. And forced enslavement is something that the Bible rightly condemns and Christians should, should be part of, of using our voices as part of the movement to see it eradicated. But slavery in the Roman world was, was mostly of a different order. Uh, you see, by and large in the Roman Empire, slavery was, was something that you might voluntarily enter into yourself if you found yourself either in extreme debt or extreme poverty. And the way it would work is that you would voluntarily surrender your freedom and, and offer yourself to, in obedience to a master in return for a wage, uh, food, board or for the paying down of a debt that you owe. That, that's the kind of slavery I think that Paul has in mind. And so here he's not so much making an argument about whether or not the institution of slavery is, is a good or a bad thing. Rather, he's saying in verse 19, he's saying, I'm using an example from everyday life. Uh, slavery was just part and parcel of the Roman world. And Paul's using it to, to illustrate this idea of spiritual slavery that he's laying out for us here in Romans chapter 6. And what Paul lays out is that when it comes to spiritual slavery, there's really just two options. You're either a slave to sin or you're a slave to obedience. Have a look at verse 16 again. He says, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you're slaves of the one you obey, whether you're slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Those are the two options. Either you're a slave to sin or you're a slave to obedience. And notice that in Paul's way of thinking, there's no neutral ground. You're either a slave to sin and it's leading you to death, or you're a slave to obedience and it's leading you to righteousness. There's no in-between. Everyone is a slave to something. And I wonder how you feel about that claim that you might be a slave to sin. I, I remember reading this part of the Bible in conversation with a young man who was exploring Christian things. And we were reading Romans together. We came to this point. And as we talked about slavery to sin, he said, no, nah, no way. There's no way you can call me a slave to sin. No one tells me what to do. I can do whatever I want. I'm free. And so I said to him, OK, if you're completely free, then I challenge you just for one week, give it a go. Use your freedom to stop sinning. Just go one week where you, where you do absolutely nothing selfish, no impure thoughts, no hurting others, no lies. Just be a perfect person for one week. Give it a go. And he thought about it. And before he even went off to give it a go, he said, well, hang on a minute, Sam. I don't think that's possible because nobody's perfect. And that's where the pennies started to drop for him. Nobody's perfect. If humans were truly free then we'd be able to stop sinning whenever we liked. But we're not free. In fact, the Bible says that we are slaves, slaves to sin, slaves to the world, slaves to our own evil desires. And that's why we so often wish we could change because we're slaves to sin. Or at least we were. 
You, you see, at this point, verse 17, Paul now kind of breaks out in praise. And he does this quite often in the book of Romans. He, he can't quite contain himself because of the news of the gospel. And so verse 17, he says to us, But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you've come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You've been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. And Paul can't help but celebrate what God has done. He sees the change that's happened. Verse 18, that the, the, the Romans have been set free from sin and become slaves to righteousness. And he thanks God for it. Now that's important to notice because Paul doesn't kind of congratulate the Romans as if this were their work. He doesn't say, well done, guys, you got yourself out of slavery, sin, uh, well done to you. No, no, no. He, he recognizes that this kind of change only comes about by the work of God. And he thanks the one who is responsible for the work. Thanks be to God that this change has taken place. But what evidence does Paul see for his claim that the Romans have been set free from sin and have now become slaves of God? How can he know that's the case? Well, have a look at verse 17. He says, but thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from the heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. Now, what does that mean? What is this pattern of teaching that the Romans have come to obey from their heart? Let's see if we can tease it out together. Now, on the one hand, one of the, the key ways that Paul talks about conversion in the book of Romans is using obedience language. Actually, that's where the letter began back in Romans chapter 1, verse 5. Paul's talking about his ministry of, of calling the Gentiles to conversion. And he says he calls them to the obedience of faith. It's the idea that, that God is calling out to a broken world and saying, repent and, and trust in Jesus to be saved. And a Christian is someone who hears that call and obeys it, says, okay, I, I repent, I, I trust in Jesus. That's the obedience of faith. The, the gospel message, I take it, that's part of this pattern of teaching that Paul is talking about back in Romans chapter 6, that the, that the Romans have come to obey from the heart. Uh, and so when Romans says they've, they've obeyed a pattern of teaching, I take it that includes the body of teaching that is the gospel message. But I don't think we can stop there because when Paul goes on in the next verse, verse 18, to describe the new lifestyle that this has resulted in for the Romans, he says, you've been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. So the pattern of teaching, I think, includes not just the teaching about the gospel, but also the Christian teaching about a life of righteous living. And so the Romans have not only accepted the gospel in their hearts, they've also had a heart change when it comes to their lifestyle. They've gone from being slaves to sin to being slaves to righteousness. They've had a change in who they obey. Now they obey God in righteousness and their obedience. It's not just begrudging obedience, but it's an obedience to God's teaching from the heart. And Paul celebrates this. He's saying, thanks be to God that you are now slaves to God. This is awesome. How good is it to be free from sin and be now slaves to God? And, and this is the point, I think, where culturally we start to feel a little bit uncomfortable. Because on the one hand, I think uh, while we, we might be happy to accept that, yes, we were once slaves of sin and now we're free. Yep, we're OK with that. But where we struggle is when Paul says, and now you are slaves to God. Uh, we begin to think, well, hang on a minute. I thought I was free. Now you're, you're telling me that I'm a slave, slave to God. And I want to dig into this idea of slavery a bit deeper, because I think for many of us, we have bought into a, a contemporary way of, of thinking about freedom that I don't think is in line either with reality or with what God says about freedom. And let me see if I can step you through it. You see, in our culture, we are all about freedom. We love it, but we hate the idea of authority. And Christians can actually fall into this way of thinking, just like the world around us. And you see, in our world, authority, it's a bit of a dirty word. And I take it that that's because, uh, fair enough at one level, because many of our experiences of authority have gone badly and authority has left a bad taste for us. 
And that's because human authority is ultimately flawed. And you, in no doubt, ha have experienced that, uh, whether that's the, the flawed authority uh, of, of someone at school or in your workplace, uh, a political authority that, in your worldview, has failed, or, or even an authority here at church. We are not immune from flawed authority. We've all experienced when authority goes wrong. And with it, we've experienced the pain that comes when someone who has given authority over you but hasn't carried it out as they should have. And because this is happening in our world, we as a society have come to the conclusion that in order to be free, what we really need to do is to throw off authority. That's the modern secular view. I'm only truly free when no one is in control of me. But what we need to grasp is that this way of thinking about freedom is actually far too simplistic and, in fact, just wrong. You see it in the simple example of a child who runs away from home. Did you, did you ever do that as a child? I did it. Ripe old age of six, frustrated of the authority of my parents denying me with ice cream after dinner, the crushing authority that I wanted to throw off. So what did I do? I packed my bag, I run down the street and I got to the park at the corner and I stopped and got scared and... I went home and because I lived in a family of four kids, no one had actually noticed that I was missing and I just sort of snuck in and on we went. But you, you think about a child who, who throws off the authority of their, uh, their parents at the age of six. Are, are they really free? Well, no, because in order to thrive and be free, a, a child actually needs good authority over them. They need an authority to provide for them. They need someone else's shelter and food, and money, and care. A child away from the good authority of a parent or guardian is in fact incredibly vulnerable in a dangerous world. With no authority, a young child is in fact much worse off. They're not free at all. You see this idea of, of thinking that freedom will come when, when we throw off authority in a different way during the moments of social upheaval, when revolution is in the air with the, with the kind of the goal of throwing off a, a known tyranny. But over and over, what we've seen in history is when people throw off one kind of tyranny, what tends to happen is they get gripped by another, often worse, tyranny. In fact, in the last few months, America has been gripped by these protests against police brutality. And, and there was, in fact, you might have seen it on the news, this protest movement in Seattle uh, designed it to throw off the authority of, of a brutal police force over one zone of the city and to declare that that community was a, was a police-free, authority-free, peaceful protest zone. And at first, the, the reports coming out of what was going on in that community were, it sounded like it was something really special. There, there were reports of this sense of community gathering and togetherness. And you'd see it as people were interviewed and, and they talk of, uh, of this kind of utopia where they'd be singing and dancing and everyone working together without the fear of police brutality. But after a couple of weeks, all sorts of problems were starting to emerge. Uh, there were muggings and then sexual assaults, a number of them, and then shootings, and the statistics of crime were, were alarming, much worse statistics of crime than usual in, in the area. And then all of a sudden, what did the people start to say? They said, well, hang on a minute, we, we need to bring in some rules here. And actually, we need someone to protect us. We need authority. And so what happened was that the community ultimately decided to invite the police back in because it just came too unsafe to be out at night time. And you see, freedom is not just about what you are free from. In fact, what you see time and time again is that we are only truly free when we're under the right kind of authority. It's there that human beings can truly thrive. We've got to make sure that we don't buy into our culture's worldview that, that we're only free when we have no authority over us. Rather, we need to see the truth in what God says that you are in fact truly free when you have good authority over you. And Paul's point is that Christians, we have the best authority over us. We are truly free because we live under the Lordship of Christ. True freedom is being able to live in service and worship. Paul calls it slavery to God, to lay your life down in obedience to the God who loves you, and who only ever asks good things of you. That's where true joy and contentment is found. That's where the good life of freedom really is. And so what Paul calls us to is a life of offering ourselves in obedience to God. That's what he says. Look at verse 19. He says, Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness 
leading to holiness. You see, here is our motivation for change. You've come to true freedom as slaves of God. And so Paul says, live out your new slavery. And notice that there's two sides to it. There's a call to to stop heeding your old master's call. When sin calls out to you, you are now free to say, no, you're free now. Free to resist temptation. Free to put off the old life. Free to say, no. But that's just one side of the coin. If that's as far as we go, we're we're missing true freedom because true freedom consists not just in what we're freed from, but what we're freed to. In our growth group uh, this week, uh, we were discussing this fact that often when we think about living for God, we only sometimes think in in terms of what we say no to. Uh, We think, here's a big long list of things that I need to stop doing. But in fact, that's only half the story, isn't it? We need to see that we have this incredible new master into whose service we've been freed. And the wonder and the goodness of offering our lives in obedience to God. And what Paul is trying to get us to see is that this new life of offering ourselves as as slaves to God, that's the good life. That's what we've been saved for. And living for God is true freedom. And so through verses 20 through 23, Paul is going to compare for us the the fruit or or the benefits of the two kinds of slavery to show us how good being slaves of God is. So verse 20, he says, When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things that you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. Whereas down in verse 22, he says, but now you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. The benefit you, le- you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. A-, a life of obedience to God is the good life. It leads to benefit, the benefit of holiness. And Paul wants us to be clear on the outcomes of these two sla- slavery so that we can choose what is best. And he sums it up for us, verse 23, that wonderful memory verse. He says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul wants you to grasp the wonder and the goodness and the true freedom of a life lived in slavery to your God. And the benefit you receive is it's the benefit of holiness. That, that's the good life, and that's what you've been created for. And, and as Christians, we need to understand this. We need to see where this true freedom is found. You see, Christians are a little bit like a fish. You see, when is a fish truly free? Uh, a fish is free to swim and to live the life it was made for when it's in the water. Can you imagine a fish kind of swimming around Sydney Harbour and looking longingly at the world beyond the boundary of the water and thinking, if only I could get up and climb the bridge and if only I could go to see something at the opera house, that'd be amazing. And you can just imagine the fish kind of thinking, I'm just going to throw off all constraints and I'm going to be free of the water. I'm going to break my boundaries and explore beyond. And the fish kind of shoots up out of the water and you can imagine it's kind of the cry of freedom. But what happens to the fish when it lands. And the fish is going to discover that freedom from constraint is not freedom at all. In fact, the fish is now trapped and very quickly will die. Christians are like fish. We're only truly free when we live within the constraints that God has created us to live within. And what Romans chapter 6 is showing us is that we've been created to be a slave to God offering obedience to our maker, our creator, with with gladness and joy in our hearts. And when we grasp hold of this and start to live it out in Christ, it's then that we're truly free. It's then that we'll find genuine satisfaction and gladness and joy. And therein lies the real motivation for a life of change. Why do we change? Why do we offer ourselves to God in holy living? It's because we've been set free from sin. And we've been set free to go and serve God. And so I want to encourage you today to celebrate the freedom of being God's slave. If you're a Christian, you've been free to serve God. And so live out your wonderful freedom. If you're a Christian, you are free on so many fronts. You are free to have your life transformed by Jesus You are free to have your character come to resemble his 
awesome, good character. You are now free to offer your life to God in honor and praise. You're now free to start living out new behaviors. You can have integrity. You can live in honesty and faithfulness. You can live in love of God and others. You're now free to do that. You are free to live a quiet life focused on doing God's will for you. You're free to read the scriptures and free to do what they say. You're free. You're free to offer your whole body in service to God, your mind, your heart, your tongue, your words, everything about who you are. You are now free to use your life in service to God. You're free to serve at church, free to serve others, free to serve God, free to sacrifice for others. You're free to be generous with your time, free to be generous with your money, free to share what you have for the good of others, free to share the gospel because you're no longer bound by the fear of others. You're no longer living in slavery to the things of this world and you can freely tell this world about the gift of God that is eternal life in Christ Jesus. This is the good life. May God teach us to rejoice in it. So finds rest in God alone, my rock and my salvation, a fortress strong against my foes, and I will not be shaken. Though lips may bless and hearts may curse, and lies like arrows pierce me, I'll fix my heart on righteousness. I'll look to him who hears me. Oh, praise him, hallelujah, my delight and my reward. Everlasting, never failing, my Redeemer, my God. My soul in God alone, amid the world's temptations. When evil seeks to take a hold, I'll cling to my salvation. Though riches come and riches go, don't set your heart upon them. The fields of hope in which I sow, a harvest of in
one of the ways that you can connect with us is to fill out an online connect card. You'll find that on our church website or in the description to this video. It's a way for you to let us know that you're here, to ask a question, or perhaps to reach out for help. We'd love to hear from you, so we encourage you to fill one out. God's Word is life-giving and powerful, and we want to invite our friends and family to explore it for themselves. Over the next few weeks on Monday nights, there's an easy opportunity to do just that. Explore is a reading group that will be running via Zoom for anyone who's interested in ex investigating Luke's New Testament account of Jesus' life for themselves. People can tune in with their videos on or off, microphones muted or unmuted. The goal is for people to come to encounter Jesus through the pages of the Gospel account for themselves. We're going to hear from Dave, who's our acting senior minister now, with a bit of an update. G'day everyone, Dave Kewen here. You may feel like we've been living out of a suitcase here at church. You know what this is like? If you still remember traveling, that is. You book a room for a couple of nights, so don't necessarily unpack your bag. You just live day to day until it's time to go home. That's certainly how we've felt together as a church. It's clear now, though, we need to unpack our bags. Social distancing and restrictions of gatherings and numbers in places of public worship will be here for an extended period of time. Now, this does have implications for us and how we can gather and what we can do. And we here have been thinking about what does this look like to unpack in this time? What would it look like for us to make healthy disciples in ever increasing number to the glory of God if this is what life is like? Well, what do we know? We know that we can have 100 people on site. And so we have recommenced a few ministries in the last few weeks, all using our COVID safe plan, which you can see the measures we're taking on our stay safe page of our website. Uh, but we have kicked off Ignite again. They've met for a couple of Friday nights. And it was so great to see the smile on kids' faces and even some new faces who have joined us. SALT continues to meet, alternating between years 7 to 9 and years 10 to 12. Night Church continues to have a watch party each Sunday night. And Arvo Church, hello to you if you are joining us in the building for your first watch party. So lots of things have started to come back. But the staff team have been working hard to think through our morning church spaces and particularly the complexities of our restricted numbers. What can we have for kids? What would it look like to have back-to-back -back services? How do we make sure North Rocks can keep meeting and the cleaning required? We are also acutely aware that many of our younger families have found this time difficult on Zoom. And so we're thinking through now what prioritizing our families back on site could look like. We aren't there yet, but hopefully have something to share with you in the next few weeks. It's just a short update on where we are up to. Look forward to telling you more in the near future. Well, what a joy it's been today to be reminded that we are no longer slaves to sin, but we are slaves to righteousness. I want to encourage us here today to meditate on these things that we've heard from Romans chapter 6 and to pray that God would help us to put it into practice this week.